watching Tag TV. I'm the Toronto Science Center, run by the Toronto Science Council. I'm from the Toronto Science Council, and it's an honor to have you all here tonight. Um, it's a very special thing for us to have two communities coming together to discuss the situations that we each find ourselves in because there are lots of issues in the world and there is not a whole lot of understanding um, and the opportunity to find out about the commonality between communities and to understand other communities is a very special opportunity for us. So on that note, I'd really like to welcome you all here and hope that we can make a difference in our issues. And uh, thank you all for coming out. And really on that note, there's not a whole lot more to say other than to welcome Schwann up here to start the program for the evening. So thank you. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. A very warm welcome to each one of you present here uh, this evening. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all to be here uh, to talk about a really, really important topic of discussion that majority of us, including media, including ourselves, is in denial of. We're talking here about Israel and Hindu Kashmir on the front lines against extremism. Israel and Hindu Kashmir, ladies and gentlemen, are similar on a lot of levels, whether it is the rich cultural heritage, their history, or the people, or the traditions that they follow. Or at the same time, the fact that both of us are the sufferers at the hands of radical Islam and radical Islamization. That is what the point of discussion will be here, and how it is impacting each one of us at the personal and at the global level. Whether it is the subjugation or the mass exodus, both the communities today are fighting in search of their own missing identities, ladies and gentlemen. And both the communities have risen like finishes. We are risen from our own ashes, and that definitely deserve a huge round of applause for both the communities present here. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, today our esteemed speakers will shed some light on all these aspects and how media is playing a role in both these cases. They'll also be talking about how radical Islamization has impacted both these communities and how the threat is now next door, miles away from our homes where we are today in a very own Canada. Do we want a similar kind of past for our children or the same kind of future that we have had? I was six years old when I was thrown away from my own homeland in Kashmir. I don't want my son, who is six years old today, to be thrown out of Toronto by these radical forces. And that is the very, very important point that we have to touch upon today, how we prevent that from happening. Whether we accept the fact or we do not accept the fact, the fact of the matter remains that the threat is very close. It's knocking on our doors, whether we are in denial or not. You look at UK, you look at France, you look at Toronto, what is happening all around us is the impact of these radical Islamists that is having on our communities. And we don't want to repeat the history of what happened in Israel or what happened in Hindu Kashmir. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I would welcome to call upon our first speaker of the evening, Sri Vidya Bhushandar, who represents the Kashmir, Hindu Kashmir side of the story this evening. Sri Vidya Bhushan is the director at Indo-Canadian Kashmir Forum and the coordinator for Global Kashmir Pandit Diaspora. A huge round of applause, and let's hear what he has to say. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. Sisters and brothers present here, my name is Vidya Bhushan Dhar a proud Indian, a Kashmiri Hindu by birth, and a Canadian through my karma. I welcome you all here. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to my Jewish brothers and sisters who for the first time in the history acknowledge the genocide as my small, peace-loving community, also called Kashmiri Pandas. From the heaven on earth called Kashmir, at the hands of radical Wahhabi Islam, I would like to thank the management of this August Zionist Center to give this opportunity to share with you 
and the civilized world at large the story of my genocide. I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart all those who are present here and all those who are watching me live unfolding the heart-wrenching tale of my genocide, of genocide of Kashmiri Hindus at the hands of militant Islam from the day it landed on my peaceful valley as a refugee. Genocide stories are not new to this audience. Human beings have faced it for centuries, but my genocide is different. It's not just genocide, but a continuous genocide since last 600 years at the hands of an ideology which is militant in nature and believes annihilation of all those who do not believe in their beliefs. I'm an Indian and a proud one. India, the fabled land of seers, sages, spiritual leaders and healers, has been a beacon of light for the West for centuries. It's known for its tremendous cultural power that has maintained a deep impact on the world for thousands of years. The richness of India's culture is manifested in a myriad traditions, languages, faiths, and rituals that lend it, lend it both wealth and depth. People of this revered land exude a sense of vitality and positive energy that conveys a sense of life. Though the West has cast its influence through colonial rule, the people of India still hold on to their rich culture and heritage, which is a thing to be marveled at. India never invaded any country in the last 10,000 years of recorded history. When many cultures were just nomadic forest dwellers over 5,000 years, India established Harappan culture in Sindhu Valley, or as we know it as Indus Valley civilization. The principal values that represent the Indian ethical system is Tyaga, or what we call renunciation. Dhana, which means liberal giving. Nishta means dedication. Satya means truth. And Ahimsa means non-violence. And Apiksha means forbearance. Vasudeva Kutumbukam possibly one of the most famous lines emerging from Vedic Sanskrit literature. This phrase is another demonstration of the all-inclusive attitude that our Indian culture has. Unity in diversity is something that we have been practicing for thousands of years. The underlying belief says the same. We have emerged from one. The Brahman, the ultimate reality. India has embraced anybody and everybody who seeks Sharnagadi or refuge, whether it was Islam's prophet Muhammad's family by the Hindu Raja Dahir, of sin or the 640 Polish children and 500 women by Maharaja Vijay Singh of Jamnagar. My birthplace, Kashmir, often called the fountainhead of Indian Vedic civilization, was a Hindu kingdom following the tenements of Sanatan Dharma, which find its roots in ancient Vedas and Puranas. And one such Purana is the Nilmat Puran. It's an ancient text from Kashmir which contains information on its history, geography, religion, and folklore. And this Purana contains probably the world's first immigration policy, which stipulates that any refugee who seeks asylum due to danger to his or her life and honor should be given refuge, provided they respect the law and ethos of the land. And this is what the Hindu ruler Sahadev did in the year 1313, when he granted asylum to the follower of Islam, Shahmir, and his family. Friends, within a short span of time, Shahmir and his country usurped the kingdom through palace intrigues and deceit and established the first Islamic regime which lasted for nearly 500 years till the year 1890 when Kashmir was annexed by Sikh ruler Maharaja Ranjit Singh's forces, thus ending the barbaric Afghan rule and more than 480 years of Muslim rule in the valley of Kashmir. The five-century rule by various Muslim rulers decimated and annihilated a highly learned, peaceful, creative and enlightened race through forced conversion to Islam loot, plunder, desecration of places of worship, rape, terror, and mass pain. In the year 1990, half a million Kashmiri Hindus were forced to flee the Kashmir Valley. The orgy of violence operated on them had left them with no choice. The choice was clearly being conveyed on the public address systems on the minarets of many mosques around in the valley, asking the Hindus to leave the valley or get killed. Threats were being issued to leave women behind for the consumption of Muslim majority. It was all in this level of intimidation and violence that the Kashmiri Pandit had to leave their ancestral land once again. Sadly, the perpetrators were not only Pakistanis, but the Muslims in the valley, who at various points of history were co-religiousness. The phenomenon, my friends, was not a sign of a new kind of intolerance. In fact, the valley of Kashmir has nurtured the same level of intolerance for hundreds of years with very brief interludes. 600 years ago, the story was the same. Sultan Sikandar, famously known as the iconoclast of Butchikan, meaning 
that he will basically desecrate and destroy any icon he can see his hand or lay his eye on. He was a religious fanatic, the like of whom we would put any bigot to shame. In order to achieve his aim of Islamizing the complete valley, he refined terror to its lowest definition. The Muslim historian Hassan describes it as an orgy of cruelty, violence, and terror let loose on the hapless Hindus. All the temples in every city, town, and village were vandalized. Their magnificent idols, creation of unparalleled workmanship, were destroyed. The material collected from these destroyed temples was utilized to construct mosques and khanqas. The one at Bijbihara in Kashmir still bears the name of Vijveshwara Khanqa, as the same was built with a salvaged material of Vijveshwara Temple. The imposing and magnificent temple at Martan, the Sun Temple, received its special attention. All his efforts to demolish it, which went in for one year, failed. He therefore thought of an ingenious method of destroying it. He dug out stones from its base and burnt wood in the gaps thus created. Even though this highest treatment failed to destroy the temple completely, it did in fact irreversible damage to the temple. The outer walls were completely destroyed, and so were the golden gilded paintings. Its ruins, even today, fill a visitor with awe and wonderment. Besides Martan, the Sun Temple, the other temples of note which were completely demolished or damaged beyond repair include those of Chakradhara, Tripureshwara, Sureshwara, Avantipura, and Parihaspura. The material of these temples was used to embankments for the city and for laying the foundations of Jama Masjid. Sikandar's onslaught on Hindus and their temples is best summed up in the 17th century Persian chronicle Tariq e Kashmir or History of Kashmir which says that Sikandar was constantly busy in annihilating the infidels and destroying most of their temples. In order to establish Nizam al-Mustafa, or the Order of the Prophet, and keep his patrons and sides in good humor, he banned all Hindu celebrations, including playing of music. He went on to the extent of banning Hindus from even putting the customary tilak, the, what we put on our uh, forehead. Hindu religious texts were collected and disposed of by either throwing them in the lake or burying them under the earth. Among the other atrocities heaped on Hindus by Sikandar were the royal edicts he issued directing Hindus to either convert to Islam or be prepared to get killed. Many converted out of fear. Thousands fled to the valley, fled out of the valley, and many preferred to poison or burn themselves to death. So many of them were killed that seven mounds, one mound equals around 37 kilograms of the sacred thread the Hindus wore, were collected from their dead bodies and burned to ashes. When Sikandar learned that the Brahmins were fleeing the valley, he had his border guards placed on the mountain passes, where many unfortunate escapees were caught and pushed down the high cliffs to meet a gory death. Such was the relentless campaign of vicious brutality, unparalleled barbarity, and genocide perpetrated by Sikandar on the Hindus that even his accomplices in the process of converting them, Hamadani, was moved to appeal to Sikandar to put a stop to such gruesome methods and instead Levi, Texas, also called the Jazia, Texas, like the rest of the India was used to. As a result, he levied Jazia taxes on all the non-Muslims in the Islamic State. It was uh, close to 94 grams of silver on them. He also introduced an institution of Sheikh islam to ensure that the injunction of Islam was strictly followed. Many Hindus preferred to go on exile rather than accept conversion, resulting in first mass exodus of Hindus from the valley. Well, my friends, that's the gory chapter of history, the medieval times, but what happened in 1990? was more shameful. I became a refugee in my own land. Who can connect more with me than my Jewish brothers and sisters present here today? What do Israel and Kashmiri Hindus have in common? A lot more than you and me can think of. We both communi communities are hated by the radical Muslims, and they invoke Allah to decimate and destroy us. During my little time in Kashmir, I heard them often saying after Friday prayers, Batan hun gyol, and gol, which loosely translated says that the seed of Hindus be destroyed by their God. I recall summer of 1990, six Israelis kidnapped from a houseboat in Kashmir, and they were told that they would be killed for being Jewish. They said it was the last second of their lives. One of the Israelis, Kobe Shemesh, said on an Israeli army radio in an interview from a hospital in Srinagar, they said if we were Jews, they would have to execute us. One Israeli and two abductors were killed. The dead Israeli was Erze Kahan. Last month, my friends, we remember the victims of Mumbai attack, the 26 11 when 10 Pakistani men came ashore in Mumbai, India, near the gateway to India monument carrying plastic explosives, grenades, and machine guns. It was Wednesday evening, the 29th of Cheshwan, 5769, or 26th of November, 2008. 
and they were about to launch the most vicious series of terror attacks on Hindu India and other non-Muslims the world had ever seen. Among the chosen target by the terrorists was the local Chabad house, known as the Narabhan house. The Chabad house was run by Chabad Lubovich emissaries Ravi Gavich Novaj, also called Gabi. He was just 29 years old. And his wife, Rivika Riviki, she was 28. The young couple had moved to Mumbai in 2003 in order to offer hospitality and Jewish awareness to Jewish travelers and to serve the small local Jewish community there. Two attackers, neighbor, their name was Babar Imran, alias Abu Akasha, and Nasir Ahmad, alias Abu Umar. They launched an attack on this center. There were eight Israelis inside the house, including Rabbi Gabriel Holzberg and his wife, Rivika. The Rabbi's two-year-old son, Moshe, was rescued by his nanny, Sandra, who had worked for the center for previous five years. The hostages were allegedly tortured. Some of the victims had been bound. Next day, they found the bodies of Gabi and Riviki. Rabbis Bentozoin, Kroman, and Lebevich, Tetronbaum, Nora Sivaric, Rabinovich, and Georgius were passed. Friends, you also remind me of another Jew, Daniel Pearl. Nearly 18 years ago, on January 23, 2002, Danny left his home, friend's home in Karachi, Pakistan, for an interview, and he never came back. He was kidnapped and later beheaded by Islamic terrorists in Pakistan in a most gruesome, inhuman way, in cold blood, by cutting his throat with a kitchen knife. His last words were, my father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, and I am Jewish, and my compatriot and daughter of soil. She recently shook the world's conscience very recently at another Jewish platform. She reverberated the same sentiments. Friends, my father is a Kashmiri Hindu, my mother is a Kashmiri Hindu, and I am a Kashmiri Hindu. And my history dates back to pre-Vedic era of over 6,000 years. Myself my, and my ancestors were decimated by radical Islamic ideologue ever since it set its foot on my land 680 years back. Not once, not twice, not even thrice, but seven times and the most recently in the early winter of 1990. Friends, I will walk you through those genocide and those seven exoduses of my community. The first genocide happened in the year 1389 and it continued till the year 1413. Sikandar, the iconoclast, ordered persecution of Hindus. Over 100,000 Kashmiri Hindus were drowned in the lake. Seven months of murdered Hindu sacred thread were burnt. Only 11 Kashmiri Hindu families were left in the valley and they were living in anonymity in jungles and caves just to save their culture, just to save themselves from the barbaric Islamic terror. The second genocide happened in 1506 and it lasted till 1586. Chak, the Shia dynasty from Gilgit invaded to rule Kashmir, made persecution of Kashmiri Hindus an official policy. They forcibly converted more than 240,000 Hindus to Islam. 900 Kashmiri Hindus were beheaded every day for not converting to Islam. The folklore says that the soldiers will go out in the uh, market or in the villages or in the towns and they will basically get the Hindus bound together in, uh, to their backs, two of them. And they will basically ask them who wants to convert to Islam will go on the right hand side of the line and who doesn't want and want to die will go on the left hand side of the line. And together they will just drown in the Tal Lake. And that lake is, that area is still called Patamazar, which means the graveyard of Kashmiri Hindus. The third genocide happened in the year 1585 at the hands of Mughal rulers. Mughals invaded and ruled Kashmir. The third Mughal king Akbar, which we all know, was a little liberal. He tried to rehabilitate Kashmiri Hindus. But Akbar son Jahangir reversed the policies and once again initiated persecution of Hindus. He forced Hindu girls to marry Muslims. Jahangir's grandson, Aurangzeb, often called the Black Mountain, continued with Islamization of Kashmir in India. Aurangzeb killed Sikh Guru Shri Teg Bahadur Ji Maharaj, who showed his support on Kashmiri Hindus. The fourth genocide happened in the year 1753, Afghan rule, and Fazal Khan and his governor, Amir Khan, continued with persecution and forced Hindus to leave Kashmir. Friends, so was the terror of the Afghans in, the, in, my, in my Kashmir, that when the girls will attain an age of 9 or 10, around puberty time, the parents will chop up their hair, they will chop up their lips and their ears and their noses, so that they look ugly and these barbaric Afghans do not take them away and break them. The fifth genocide happened in the year 1930. After 500 years of Muslim rule, in 1820, Sikhs and Hindu Dogras reclaimed the power to rule Kashmir. 
British promoted communal hatred to push their divided rule policy, promoted young Muslims to revolt against Jogra rule in Kashmir. 13th July 1931, Muslims attacked Kashmiri Hindus' life and property and killed many innocent Hindus. October 1947, when India was divided on the basis of religion, Pakistani raiders attacked Kashmiri Hindus and killed many, forcing another exodus from the valley. Six exodus happened in the year 1986, targeting killing, targeted killings of Hindu Kashmiris triggered another exodus. Their temples were desecrated, their homes were set on fire, and their girls were taken away in rape. The seventh exodus, which is present exodus, which happened in the year 1990. And the ethnic cleansing is at its worst in the modern civilized world. Ethnic cleansing, which is continuing from the year 1986 onwards, First nail in the coffin was on February 21, 1986 in the city of Anantanag, Kashmir. 40 Kashmiri Hindu temples were desecrated, 1500 Kashmiri Hindus houses were looted, 300 Kashmiri Hindus houses and temples were set ablaze. In 1989, leading community activists, scholars and educationists targeted and killed the Muslim terrorists. Kashmiri Hindu businesses were destroyed and looted. Kashmiri Hindu properties were looted and burned. The unified and sometimes reassuring political slogan of long live Hindu Muslim security had suddenly disappeared. <coughs> and I'm telling you this because I was a spectator, I was there in the year 1989. It just disappeared for the political parallels of the Muslim crowds. Seeming, seeming to him was given to go by their rational pattern of conduct as components of a civilized life, making bonfires of tires at night, ensuring by coercion the participating of Hindu coffins. All a dramatic blend of frenzy, ignorance, fantasy, and naivety, tinged green by the foot soldiers of Islamic radicalism. The new slogan being mouthed with zooming zest, present in ML, amazingly myopic content declaring war against Hindus, threatening them with death and destruction, allowing them with no leeway, frightening them to quit and buzz off, stressing the established meant the prophet's governance and exposing low levels of cultural achievement. There was slogan ring all around. Kashmir mein rehna hai to Allah Akbar pehna kehna hai. If you choose to live in Kashmir, you have to say Allah Akbar. I say Kashmir, Pakistan, bata uros to bata usan. We want Pakistan with Hindu Kashmiri women and without their men for. Allah Akbar, Muslimaan ho jago, kafir ho bado, jihad aa raha hai. Allah Akbar, arise and evoke Muslims, buzz off infidels, jihad is approaching. Kashmir kya banega? Pakistan. What will Kashmir be? Pakistan. Zalimo, Kafiro, Kashmir, Hamara Chordo. Ye Kriyal Kafirs, you infidels, vacate our Kashmir. Yahan kya chalega, Nizam e Mustafa. What will sway here? Prophet's governance. Arise, ye fearless moments, for Russia has lost the race. Now the sword hangs on India's neck. Now it's Kashmir's turn. Islam Hamara Maksad hai. Quran Hamara Dastur hai. Jihad Hamara Rasta hai. Islam is our destination. Quran is our constitution. And Jihad is our way. Hame kya chahiye Nizam e Mustafa. Kashmir mein chahiye chalega Nizam e Mustafa. Hindustan mein chalega Nizam e Mustafa. What do we need? We need Prophet's governance. What we will really sway in Kashmir? Prophet's governance. And what will sway in India? Prophet's governance. The net product of the Islamic agenda, as spearheaded by the Kashmiri Muslim crowds chanting slogans, replete with hostility and hatred onto the Hindus, was an exodus. A forced exodus in the modern world modern civilized world who just kept their eyes shut and looked away. <coughs> a manipulation for the genocide happened, completing the program which was conceived 600 years back in the 14th century when Islamic radicalism set foot on the valley for the first time. In face of an armed onslaught, the Kashmiri Hindus marched out of their native, native land once again to save their skin and their faith. The villagers, poor and destitute, allowed their cows and bulls with garlands onto the, on to stray away. Prowled away by monsters of murder, loot, and arson. The Hindus were the border town, the Hindus from the border towns of Kupwara and Handwara in North Kashmir, with the first to flee en masse, followed by their teenage girls from Srinagar and towns and hamlets in south of Kashmir. Flight of the Hindus from the millennia, old homes and huts had started. As if this was not enough, my friends, a systematic campaign of murder, rape, and torture was inflicted on the helpless Hindus of Kashmir, who were still thinking that this is a passing phase and normalcy will soon return to value but they were mistaken. The descendants of Sikandar and Aurangzeb had taken their lives of more than 2,000 Hindu men and women and children. The terrorists indulged wantonly in abduction, rape, murder, arson, extortion, and looting. There were thousands of blood-chilling stories of terror. An innocent young woman, 
Her lab assistant in the school was abducted. She was blindfolded, gang raped by a group of men, and then she was cut into half, two halves, on a mechanical saw, and she was still alive. Her name was Girja Tengu. Her only crime, my friend, was her faith, and she was peaceful. The list is endless. Hindu government officials, political leaders, and workers, members of judiciary, print and electronic press persons, and prominent citizens were threatened, attacked, and killed. Religious courts of conduct were imposed on common people in the valley, and there was large-scale destruction of public property and private property, including over 400 secular state schools. More than half a million Hindus had to flee their homes in the valley, and they lived as refugees in other parts of their own state and the country. This is the accomplishment of the secessionist pro proxy war in Kashmir by the radical Islam. The cold, dark night of January 1990 had stirred into life the first nightmares of Kashmiri Hindus living in the valley. Screaming from the loudspeakers top, atop mosque minarets and crowded streets was a message for the Sikhs and Hindus living in Kashmir. Relief, Sayyid, or Kali. This was exactly the diktat which was given to Hindus 600 years back by Sikandar and his poetry. Which means either you convert to Islam or you die or you are allowed to flee. The pundits could see the writing on the wall. If they were lucky enough to see the night through, they, were, they would have to vacate the place before they would meet the same fate as Tikal al Taplu and many others. The summoned exodus was shortly staring at them on their face. By morning, it became apparent to Kashmiri Hindus that Kashmiri Muslims had decided to throw them out from the valley. Broadcasting vicious jihadi sermons and revolutionary songs interspersed with blood curling shouts of and shrieks threatening Kashmiri Pandits with dire consequences became a routine mantra for the Muslims of the valley to force them to flee from Kashmir. The so called civilized world remained silent. And the global apathy was so rampant, local, state, and national governments failed to protect Kashmiri Hindus and their fundamental rights. Leading international human rights organizations failed Kashmiri Hindus by ignoring their political, economic, and cultural genocide. National and international media aided and abetted their genocide by totally ignoring it. Gradual extinction of a peaceful, civilized community with ancient culture yet to shake the conscience of the world even after 30 years of that force exodus. National and international filmmakers, they ignored our genocide story and instead made films justifying and glorifying the militancy in Kashmir by radical jihadis. How can you who are present here and those who are watching me live help me, a Kashmiri Hindu, return back to his ancestral home by breaking the silence and speaking out against global terrorism which you see here in your own home slowly creeping in and knocking on your doors? By engaging media and forcing them to focus on the story, by forcing policy makers to enact and implement legislations against global terrorism and countries that harbor terrorists, by engaging human rights organizations and making them aware of our cultural and physical genocide, by raising and donating funds that will go towards preservation of Kashmiri Hindus' culture and heritage, by collaborating with Kashmiri Hindu organizations and advocacy projects. My septuagenarian father and mother had lost hope of returning back to my home. But something unthinkable happened after 30 years of helplessness and hopelessness. Friends, recently, something happened which, will, which will pave the way of my tribes returning back to Kashmir, as reported by noticed activist, writer, and TV host, my dear brother and friend Tariq Fatah in his own indomitable style. On August 5, 2019, the government of India revoked the special status it had conferred on its only Muslim-majority state, the state of Jammu and Kashmir. In doing so, India demonstrated a spinal cord of steel, this coming after a thousand years of Arab, Turkic, Persian, and Afghan Islamic invasions, followed by Portuguese, French, and British colonization, which had reduced it to male spaghetti. India today stands as tall as the Himalayas and walks as gracefully as the Bengal tiger. As expected, friends, Pakistan invoked its self-styled role as the godfather of Islamic Islamists. The country's military-backed Prime Minister Imran Khan Niazi, he made a barely concealed threat of a nuclear attack unless India revoked its action taken in its own sovereign territory. Then, as if to mollify his threat of a worldwide nuclear catastrophe, Khan fooled no one by insisting this was not a nuclear blackmail. Article 370 and 35A, they were hindering the development of JNK state, my friends. In spite of sub substantial financial outlay by the central government, for the last 70 years, to the state, the results were not visible on the ground. 
abrogation of Article 370 will not only pave the way for extending the jurisdiction of the National Commission for Minorities of the State, now residents of the state can accrue benefits of central legislative schemes, for example, Ayushman Bharat, Minimum Wage Bill, Right to Information Act, Land Negotiation Bill, Reservation for Tribals and Dalits, etc. The notion that abrogation of Article 370 will lead to the loss of Kashmiri identity of Kashmir is totally unfolded. Kashmir culture and current defunct language, the, Kashmir, the Kashmiri language, my friend, it, it, it pains me to tell you that we were the only state in entire India, in independent India, where I was not taught my own Kashmiri mother tongue. That language was decimated because it was in Sanskrit. And the rulers that time, they didn't want the Muslims to read Sanskrit because it had a connotation that it's a Hindu language. My language has reduced to just almanacs and probably the horoscopes. I want to go back to my land and revoke and get that language back to its lost glory. A new dawn leading to an all-round development will usher in a state after revocation of Article 370, leading to investment by leading corporate industrial houses, generations of unemployment, employment opportunities. It will boost the trade and tourism in general. It's evident that Kashmir's 70-year-long association with Article 370 did not yield any tangible benefit for the state. It would be prudent to wait for at least five years before we could assess the benefits reaped by the state on account of abrogation of Article 370. Friends, I would like to share some key points on situation in JNK post revocation of Article 370. The radical forces are creating a very bleak picture of Kashmir. That mayhem is created there. People are being killed. Women are being raped. It's all hogwash. It's just a narrative which is created by this jihadi brigade. The situation in Kashmir is returning to normalcy. In 166 out of the 90, 196 police stations, no data restrictions are enforced. These include around 91 police stations in Jammu, 6 police stations in Ladakh, and around 80 police stations out of 99 in Kashmir. The remaining 30 police stations in the valley, some restrictions are still necessary to make sure that Pakistan and Pak-sponsored terrorists do not misuse <coughs> freedom of movement or communication to cause widespread violence and Kashmiris, Kashmir terror attacks. There have been no deaths and no live bullets have been used since August 6th. No major violence, ha uh, violent incident has happened. And reports of abduction of young boys and women and they're being subjected to inhuman treatment is absolutely false and black and white. All schools in Jammu and Ladakh region and around 70% of the schools, primary schools in Kashmir Valley are open now. People are free to perform religious obligations in most of the mosques, including Friday prayers in Kashmir. 22 district courts are functional. Hospitals and medical shops are open. There are no reports of food shortage. Traffic is flying normally in most parts of JNK and all the over 1,000 ATMs are functional. Need to underscore to the interlocutors that the Indian state like Nagaland, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Arunachal Pradesh are Christian majority states and Punjab has a majority Sikh population. Therefore, JNK is not the only state in India where the majority community is in the majority in a particular state. There has been no demographic change in these states. Therefore, the falsehood being propagated by the Pakistan and its poetry around the world that a removal of Article 370 will lead to a demographic change is unfolded. In terms of both absolute numbers and percentage of population, friends, the number of Muslim citizens has grown between 1951 and 2011 from 34 million, which was 9.8% of the population of India at that time, to around 172 million, which is 14% of the population now. It may be emphasized that in some of the India's largest states, including Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and West Bengal, number of Muslims is more than the national average. Whereas in Pakistan, minorities are intimidated in national and regional elections. The blasphemy law, as we all know, allows the state and majority communities to target religious minorities without giving equal rights to minorities. In Pakistan, minorities are debarred from assuming highest constitutional posts, whereas in India, secular laws apply evenly to all com communities, and many citizens from minorities have raised the highest offices of the land. Hospitals, medical facilities are all functional. 76 out of the 94 telephone exchanges in Kashmir are functional. Or landline, mobile phones are working in Kashmir, and internet also has been restored in most of the parts. I'm obligated to all my Jewish brothers and sisters, and all those who are present here, who acknowledged our genocide early this year in Toronto. Indians and Jews share every obligation to reverence for others, for the rule of law, and for democracy. And lately, we have seen we have been drawn together by our joint fight against mindless, vicious, fanatic Islamic terrorism. As a Kashmiri Hindu, what I have learned from my Jewish brothers and sisters is to never give up. 
hope. That's what keeps us strong. Just like us, Jews have also faced numerous mass exoduses from their land, Israel. From the last 2,000 years, they were away from their home and almost hope to always hope to get back to where they belong to. Their struggle teaches us how hope can help us achieve our dreams. Today, Jews are living in their home sweet home, Israel. This gives me hope that we Kashmiri Hindus will also go back to our home sweet home, Kashmir, and live peacefully. We Kashmiri Hindus share not just a common bond with our Jewish brothers and sisters, but Kashmir Valley Association, a date back to thousands of years. The Hebrew Bible and the Talmud tells us that twice a day, Keturit, a mysterious, costly, and powerful incense mixture was burned in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. While there is uncertainty about the 11 spices that went into the incense mix, one of the items was clearly spelled out in the Talmud. The Israelis call it Kosht or Kostas, and it has been identified as having originated in Kashmir. With its Kashmiri origin, Kushta in Sanskrit or Kut in Kashmiri was accorded highest honor as a Vedic plant god. It was considered as the brother of the divine Soma. The Kashmiri Hindus of yore, they held the Kushta powers in great esteem. Charaka, the native of Kashmir and a principal contributor of the Ayurveda medical science, rated Kushta as one of the same Avachurna used for the treatment of various skin diseases. The association of Kashmir with Jews was first alluded by the 11th century Muslim scholar Al-Biruni in his India book. In former times, the inhabitants of Kashmir used to allow one or two foreigners to enter their country, particularly Jews. When I read the beautiful national anthem of Israel, Hatikwa, which means hope, it took me that it's my story and I'm confident that I'll soon be able to go back to my home, not as a tourist, but as a son of the soil. And uh, that there will be never another pogrom, no genocide, no ethnic cleansing, or another force exodus. I conclude my sp speech with a Sanskrit shloka, which Kashmiri Hindus used to pray before meal. Atank hinam jagastu sarvam, or let the whole world be terror free. for those uh, words. Uh, it defin definitely gave us a perspective about uh, how the radical Islamization has impacted the day-to-day -day life of a Kashmiri Hindu. On that la note, ladies and gentlemen, I'll take a second to uh, thank our partners today. Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, Canadian Institute of Jewish Research, Peru, Canada, Hasbro Fellowship, Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora, Indo-Canadian Kashmir Forum, Baloch Human Rights Council, and our media partners, TAC TV and ZTV Canada. A huge round of applause for all of these. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome our second speaker for the evening, Daniel Boatman. Daniel is Communication Coordinator of Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation and host of TAC TV's Uninterrupted. A huge round of applause. Thank you everyone so much for coming out. Um, my style is going to be a bit different than videos. If you have watched my show before, you do. You might know that I am prone to bits of being a bit entertaining. Um, so without that, let's get let's into it. So I name this the front lines against extremism, and it's not just radical Islam, although that is true. That that threatens our communities. There is a whole host of extremists working together that that pose a great threat to. Jewish community, Hindu community, Kashmir community, and the wider Western uh, communities. So we have radical Islam, intersectional theory or leftists, the media malpractice, the enablers, globalist theory, UN control, and of course the alt-right. So I'm going to start this pretty quickly. How many of you have, let's say, because not everyone's here at the Jewish community, how many don't know a lot about Israel? Fair. Excellent. That's great. I'm glad you're here. So we're going to debunk Palestine in under two minutes. Okay. Now, you might have heard of the Bible, but not many people have a copy of the Palestinian Bible, which I do. It's the exact same thing, except they added in one line, because on the first day, God created the heavens, the earth, and the Palestinian people, which means the Palestinian people predate animals, plants, human beings. They were there first. Everything you see around you is a Palestinian. Everything is Palestinian. Now, this might be a bit silly, but it gets even sillier when you actually look at what they do. You might not know a lot about the Bible, but you've probably all heard the term David and Goliath. Yeah. 
right? King David and Goliath. All right, the story is David was an Israelite and Goliath was a Philistine. He had the slingshot, he killed Goliath, became really famous, then became the second king of Israel, establishes the capital in Jerusalem. Goliath is a Philistine. Now the Philistines were ancient enemies of the Jewish people in biblical times. So let's fast forward a couple thousand years. In the year 132, there are the Bar Kokhba revolts. This is a religious uprising against the Romans, who at that point are occupying Judea, as it's called. It's called Judea. We are called Jews because we come from Judea. Judea is the land you call Israel. So as a punishment for the Bar Kokhba revolts, the emperor at the time renames the area Palestine or Philistine to name it after the ancient enemies of the Israelis, the Philistines as punishment, which is where the name Palestine comes from. Now, it gets better because the Palestinians are indigenous to Israel. But when you break down the name Palestine, it's Plishtut in ancient Hebrew. Plishtut isn't really a people, it's ancient Hebrew for invaders. So when you say the Palestinians are indigenous to Israel, what you are really saying is the indigenous and the invaders of Israel are indigenous to Israel. That is, what, that is literally, if you break down the meaning of that phrase, what it means. Now, it gets even better, because the Palestinians can't even say Palestine. There is no P sound in Arabic. Find an Arabic word that says P. You cannot. Which is why, when you hear Hamas talk about Palestine, they will talk about Palestine or Palestine, because there is no P Palestine in Arabic but they're in the indigenous to everything. So, Palestine. Now, you really, if you, I'm not gonna go into all the history of Israel because we'd be here all night. There's a lot of issues that can get us here all night. This is all you really need to know as a 101, okay? This is British mandate for Palestine. This is the mandatory area. Now, it was not mandated, it's called a mandate, right? There's a French mandate for Syria, British mandate for Iraq. But if you notice the British mandate for Palestine, you might notice that's two countries today. That is modern, Israel, and this is modern Jordan. Now, Palestine was agreed upon, British Manic Palestine, as a homeland for the Jewish people that would respect the rights of all minorities there. And this was agreed upon in 1920's San Remo Conference. San Remo is, is legally binding. Arabs were there, Brits were there, French were there, Jews were there, Japanese, a whole host of things were there, ratified by the, um, by the League of Nations, made legal by the United Nations. So all of this is fully legal. Legally, this is legal Israel. Now, 1922, this is put out. In 1923, who isn't happy? Arabs. Arabs not very happy. So this Palestine is actually schismed into two. That is where you get East Palestine and West Palestine. East Palestine becomes the Trans, uh, Trans Jordan, what you now know is Jordan. West Palestine becomes Israel. Now, it was not called Palestine because the Arabs in the 1920s hated the name Palestine. Why? They cannot say it. Well, I live in a country you cannot say. So they changed it to Jordan. The Jews don't like the name Palestine because it's an ancient insult for Philistines. We'd rather be living in Israel. But there's still a lot of hoopla um, after this happens. Okay, now it was supposed to be. So here we're going to talk about the three-headed monster of anti-Semitism. This is what we deal with today. You know, the alt-right or white supremacy, the radical left, Antifa and their friends, radical Islam. And don't worry, they're not anti-Semitic. They're just anti-Zionist. Zionism is the right for Jewish people for self-determination land of Israel. So they don't want it. They're not Nazis. They just want to eradicate six to six and a half million Jews, in case you're confused. Now, let's get into the big one. So the ancient, not the ancient, the, 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 the greatest enemy of Israel since its inception is the Muslim Brotherhood. And they're the enemy of anyone who likes not radical Islam. So there is Hassan al-Banna. He is the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1929. There is his good friend, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini. That is the Mufti's grand, uh, very good friend as well. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah. Adolf Hitler. Now, Haj Amin al-Husseini was good friend with Adolf Hitler, Adolf Eichmann. He, had a, he was part of planning the final solution. There are letters between him and Eichmann about the final solution. There were plans to build an extermination camp in Jerusalem. So Zionism in Israel caused the, everyone was so peaceful. Israel's 1948, he's collaborating with Hitler. Hitler, this is 1930s, okay, so it's a lot. Now, Hajime Al-Husseini also did travel to Europe. He had an active role in the Holocaust, the Second World War. He recruited Muslims into the SS. This is the Nazi uh, paramilitary force, like the SS, um, the ideological force of their army. 
Uh, he went to Bosnia, he managed to recruit uh, a bunch of Bosnian Muslims, and because of his work, um, half a million Jewish um, Hungarians were able to be murdered because the partisans had actually been able to disrupt the trains to the camps in Hungary, but because he raised enough SS members, the Nazis were able to guard the trains and kill half a million Hungarian Jews. That is his legacy. Sorona Shada Talib talks about, I'm so proud of my Palestinian brothers for saving from the whole, nope, the bread of Jerusalem uh, had, had a personal hand in half a million Jews dying. Okay, so now, here's some examples. In 1929, Hebron, there is a massacre. Again, why? Because Israel exists, this is still 20 years beforehand. In the Arab riots in the 1930s, Hajime al husseini would be given fighters from the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt from his friend Hassan al-Banna. So when the Muslim Brotherhood says we're non-violent, except when it comes to Israel and Jews. The Muslim Brotherhood has been very clear, we are for violence if we are killing Jews. 100% of the time, this has always been their thing. Also, if you read any of Sai Kutub, big killing everyone. Um, Jewish refugees were not allowed to come to British Mandate Palestine during the Holocaust because of the Arab revolts and uprisings. So for a whole decade, you had, you had slaughter of people. Now, there's also the way we reject the 1947 partition plan in this war. They are created as a Hamas. I'm going to go back to Hebron right now because you hear a lot about Hebron. Hebron is an ancient Jewish city. Jews don't think of a lot of things as holy. I mean, the Temple Mount is, is the holy thing, but there's not a lot of holy objects, although Israel is holy to us. If there is a second holiest city in Judaism, it's Hebron. It is where the tombs of the patriarchs and matriarchs are. So you might know a bit about Judaism. There's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their wives. They're buried in Hebron. Now the tomb of the patriarchs, according to UNESCO and the United Nations, is a Palestinian. <laughs> no, no, it is. It's a Palestinian heritage site. An ancient Palestinian heritage site. So truth doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We're going to get into why truth doesn't matter, but you just should know that. So we talk about Jews recently, uh, the settlers in Hebron, a lot of the settlers in Hebron were people in 1967 who returned to their literal homes that they were kicked out of in the 1929. There are people who actually, like there's me on the wall, like little Daniel at four foot two or whatever he is. They were going there. These are settlers, according to the world community. Okay, now here's where we come, there's what we have in common. Jamaat e Islami. This is the, the Hindu's version of the Muslim Brotherhood. They, it's, it's called the Muslim Brotherhood in Southeast Asia, founded in 1941. It's basically the same thing. We have Hamas. Hamas wants to kill us all. They have a charter. In their, they do have a charter. Hamas is a charter. Kill all the Jews. It's very, very clear. And they want to, Israel is their land because Muslims want sat down there, so it's Muslim. <laughs> Says it in their charter. You can go look it up. Jamaat e Islami has a militant faction, Hezbollah Mujahideen. They have a charter. Hindu is bad. Jews, think of Hamas, call it Hezbollah Mujahideen, take the word Jew, throw in Hindu, take the word Israel and Palestine, take it out, put in Kashmir, boom, you got a Hezbollah Mujahideen, Hindus reverse the opposite, it's the same thing. Same thing, we have the same enemies, they do the same stuff. Now, in Canada, what do we love? Hockey, maple syrup, and funding terrorism. Okay? We love to fund terrorism. So, Hamas gets the most of the money, because they're the big guys, but don't feel left out Hindus. Hezbollah Mujahideen gets government funding too. Now, it's so bad, and this is the worst one, the ISN. There is a, there's an organization called the Islamic Society of North America, ISTA, you might know it. They have a reviving the Islamic spirit conference coming up soon. Justin Trudeau will make an appearance. He says he shares shared values with ISNA. Now, ISNA last year had its third terrorism funding violation, and it was suspended by the CRA. So the Canadian government said, hey, it's not, no more money, you're not a charity this year, you're suspended for funding, sending hundreds of thousand dollars to Hezbollah Mujahideen, bad boys. Also, for our Canadian Summer Jobs Program, guess who gets summer jobs money? ISNA. Well, we were suspended from the Canadian government. The Canadian government suspended ISNA, said you're funding terrorism, also, here's $25,000. Now, the Canadian Summer Jobs Program, you have to be like fully informed of abortion. Apparently, you, if you, apparently they're very big fans of abortion. It is not, I don't know. So that was the most blatant example of how the hell did they get government funding when they were suspended by the very government that gave them funding, but it does not matter. Okay, so this whole part is, how does Islamic extremism get here? Why should Canadians who aren't Hindu, aren't Jewish, why should you care about this? So this next part is, I'm going to explain what I call ideological laundering uh, through human rights language. So idea laundering, if you know money laundering, the mob 
you know, you know, racketeering, sending it through a, a washing machine business. This is ideological laundering. This is going to be this part. So two things. Uh, the radical left's erosion of academia through intersectionality. This is a big part of it. Um, the ideologically corrupt media and just media breaking down. That's another part of it. And then we have our enablers and useful idiots who play a big role in making Canada a place and a safe haven for all those lovely ISIS, sorry, foreign travelers returning here to spread peace. Now, be prepared to get into the really, this is going to be really, really tough, but this is modern academia. So put your thinking caps on, because you're about to learn intersectionally 101, intersectionality 101. If you have not been to university in the last 10 years, prepare yourselves because this is, I'm going to teach you everything you will learn if you take like a sociology course for four years. All right, whites are bad, non-whites are good, gay is better than straight, trans beats gay, man bad, woman good, Christians are bad, Muslims are good, Jews are just half a step above white, Asians, go. Oh, let's just ignore them for now. Uh, this is important. Life is a zero-sum game. It's very important. People are either oppressed or oppressors, and apostates will be punished. Did we get that? Congratulations, you now all have a master's in sociology from York University. <laughs> um, no, so collect your degrees on the way out. Uh, Andrew will be handing them out. You're all now qualified to teach a course at York University. And the reason I say it, yes. What, what do you mean by life is a zero sum game? Life is a zero sum Excellent question. We get that. So um, that means, like, if I have something, if I am rich, it's because you are poor. So, okay, so it's that, like, that's connected to the next pool of poor. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, oppressor, no, exactly. Yeah. It means, so, an example of Israel, you know, the reason that Palestinians are doing so poorly is because Israel has money. And the more money Israel has, it means the less they will take Palestinians. It's, it's, a, it's a flawed economic concept, but it's also used by the radical left for the rich. It is why if we, if we just put in a million percent tax on the billionaires, all that money then goes to us. It's economically flawed, we can get into why, but it's a very important fundamental assessment of the modern left. And I say apostates will be punished because this pyramid does not apply to you if you do not play the game. Think of Ayaan Hirsi Ali, who I hope you all know. She's fantastic, I highly recommend her books. She is a Somali refugee, victim of Etienne, a uh, black Somali refugee woman, but she believes in Western values of freedom in the individual, so she is boycotted from Brandeis University, she's dangerous, she's no one, right? So if, you're not, if you don't believe in the game, you're punished, and you're scum of the scum, scum of the earth. So you're eye on her ceiling. Now I just, this is just some, this is uh, from the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center, this is one of the key assessments of the radical left now that I just want to bring up. All of this is, is them, but um, you'll hear that, you know, oh, black people can't be racist towards whites, or these people can't be racist, because racism now is about power plus privilege. Power and privilege. And as I see, race, is racism is an exercise of power, not discriminating, negative discrimination based on people's race is racism. But now it's the intersection of power and privilege in society, and it's all about power. Now, I detest this thoroughly because, to me, this is the logic of the Ku Klux Klan. We all heard Klan. You, what power? What power? The Klan's fundamental assertion in the 1920s to 1950s was white power. Whites are the most powerful people in this society. White people built this society. Intermixing the other less powerful people with one white society will corrupt white society and ruin it. That's why we must maintain white power. And the logical conclusion is segregation, separate but equal. But now you have intersectionality which says whites are the most powerful. Who has the most power in this structure? The whites, because the whites can be racist to anyone. Now, it's very clear when you're at university, they let you know that white people are bad. But I remember taking a course called Human Geographies where you learn nothing about human beings or geography. <laughs> and it was basically, if I could sum it up, it's white power, white people are the best, but it was the most condescending racist course I've ever taken. Everything was about the aboriginals, we learned nothing about the aboriginals either, but you essentially learned that before white people came, there was a bunch of non-white people and they were just playing the bongos, smoking weed, having a great time, everything was peaceful, and then whites came along, and this was an actual assertion of a far left professor I had, is that white people value and invented innovation. Now, innovation is bad to her. It's also the, the bedrock of our modern society. It's the reason why you're not all freezing to death right now in Canada. But innovation was white. 
Now that was bad, and white people are bad for innovating. But how insane and racist is that? Radical left. Now, when you get into this concept of white power, and the left will say, oh, we need to break down the systemat systematic institutional racist power of the whites. Well, isn't that exactly what the Klan was saying? Now, you're just saying it from the opposite end, which is why the logical conclusion of intersectional leftism is segregation, separate but equal. Here is a, a black-only graduation and commencement uh, at, at, at Harvard University. Blacks only graduation at Harvard from the New York Times. So if you want to say, oh, this is just a fringe. It's just a fringe of the radical left. It's a fringe. Don't worry about it. Then you have to say that Harvard University and the New York Times are fringe organizations. Separate for equal. All right. Now let's meet our friend. Everyone's favorite friend. Uh, this is, this is, no, that's Justin Trudeau in 20 years. Uh, <laughs> but that's true. It's coming here. The left needs classical anti-Semitism. It does. Now, maybe not if you're older, when you, the left, you know, the, the liberal left, not them, but this new intersectional left, this, this theory of the left, it needs anti-Semitism to be true. Because Jews pose a big, big, big problem for left-wing ideology when it comes to their economic policies and social policies. The left will make the contention that racism and discrimination can explain everything, especially economic inequality. So blacks, white, you're poor? Well, that's because people are discriminating against you. Now, there are some legitimate studies on how racism is, it has negative cognitive defects. I'm not, not throwing racism out the window here. But the fundamental contention of the left is the colored people need us. By the way, um, colored people is racism. They are now people of color, which is not racism. <laughs> this is the level of thinking. So people of color need us. Uh, to fix this because if we get rid of racism, well, then you'll make more money. The reason why there's inequality in e e education or whatever is because of racism. However, Jews do financially better than the average population. Yeah, we all know this. So do Indians. But Jews make more money than the general population. Okay? We can talk about the other population, we can talk about why, culture, and all that. Who experiences the most hate crimes in our society? It's Jews. Jews experience the most hate crimes, both physical, racial, whatever you want to call it, the highest rate of hate crimes, yet they earn more money. We're actually not at the top in the society, but we're above average. How do you explain that? It runs counter to your ideology, which is why you need to institute in, again, a zero-sum game. All right, then now, the Jews have some sort of shadowly cabal behind them. There's not, not the good Jews, there's some good Jews, right? There's some uh, yes master Jews, Bernie Farber and his friends. <laughs> Right? There's some Jews who will, uh, oh, we're the good ones. But you need the anti-Semitism because you need to assert, well, the reason why the Jews are doing well in the system, yes, racism is still bad, but they're cheating in the game. Right? There's this cabal, it's the bankers, or it's the Zionists, or it's Israel. Right? There's some, I, know, I have a friend who says I'm not anti-Semitic. Right? He went to Hebrew day school once, but there's this other Jews behind the scenes, and they're playing this nefarious game, right? as we talked about it. The Jews have all this money, and they're getting it from the Palestinians. Right? So you need this ideology. You need this sort of classical shadowy cabal of Jews doing something behind the scenes to maintain the integrity of your failed economic ideology. So that's why, if you don't think that Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is our Liberal Party in 15 years at most, you're asleep. All right. So let's get on to another, per another one of our friends, the media. Look at those poor children. <laughs> All of these are innocent children. Now, here's a game that, that the media plays on Israel. These are people that Hamas has taken credit for and said, these are our fighters. We did it. They were died during Jihad. They died fighting Israel. But they released to the NGOs and the media and Amnesty International that um, this 12-year-old boy, he died being innocent. That's an 11-year-old girl. She died innocent. And then the NGOs say, the government in Gaza reports Israel killed innocent, whatever. Now, it only lasts for a day before they have to retract it, but it gets out there. We don't talk about the government in Gaza is the registered terrorist organization, Hamas, which means they get to lie to the NGOs. The NGOs tweet it out. Then they go around and take credit and say, they're terrorists. Everyone celebrate. They hand out sweets and candy in the streets. The media is asleep. Then someone, it's the Jews have to get onto it, it's ominous reporting Canada or us, we have to write to the CBC or whatever to issue a traction. Then okay, we'll we'll change the head, uh, we'll change the third paragraph a little bit to reflect that okay, yes, they were actually ended up being terrorists. But damage done. 
Don't take my word for it, listen to Hamas. So during the, uh, the Great March of Return, or the Invasion of Peace, as I name it, there were 62 people killed at, in the border riots. Trying to, they were trying to openly breach the border with Israel for the purpose of killing them. As Hamas said, the leader of Hamas on the right said, we will go into Israel and tear their hearts out. So while trying to tear the hearts out of Jews, um, 62 people died. 50 of them were from Hamas. Actually, three of them were Islamic Jihad. Nine of them were, were not. But the media reported 62 innocent people. Even while Hamas was getting saying, actually, 50 of them were our members who died trying to kill Jews and Jihad. We're very proud of them. No retractions, doesn't matter. Now, is this only a Jewish problem? Not really. And how gullible is the media? Let's meet my friend, conservative Senator Salma Atulajan. Salma Atulajan is there. She's in front of a mic. She is wearing a, a Pakistan costume, just flags of Pakistan. This is during the Article 370 thing. Now, she is, gonna, she is at the Pakistani consulate making a speech about Kashmiri independence. Kashmir needs independence. India is evil. Pakistan is it's just concerned about all India. Now, while she is opining about Kashmiri independence, she is standing behind this sign, which in Urdu says, Kashmir will become Pakistan. One of these slogans from the 1990 genocide. This is a woman, a conservative senator, at the Pakistani consulate, saying Kashmir needs independence, standing beside a sign that says it does not. How obvious can you be? And the answer is incredibly obvious because the media don't care. Am I the greatest, greatest media person of all time? I hope not. But I'm the, am I the only one? No, no, look. And she do all the, the standard things of, oh, you know, India, we needed Pakistan because India wasn't a safe place for Muslims and Muslims would be discriminated against. Meanwhile, every non-Muslim has been almost ethnically cleansed out of Pakistan. It's illegal to even be an Ahmadi Muslim in Pakistan. It's a different denomination. It's illegal. It's considered blasphemy. Sikhs are almost all dead. All the Hindus are gone. Christians are. And we have the Asia BB case, if you remember, tried to kill her. So hopefully this video works. Um, I have something where I say, like, you know, what's the line here? So this comes from um, an India Day celebration here in Toronto. An India Day group of Indians went to go celebrate India. Rather innocuous. But at the Pakistani consulate, where our friend Salman Tulajan made a speech, they whipped up a mob of Pakistani Islamists and Khalistani radicals. They whipped up the mob, then they marched down to uh, front of um, City Hall, and they accosted a group of Indians. This one guy in a white shirt, he is the lone Indian there. So hopefully this plays. So as you see, now he's he's um, he's going out. Um, okay, let me just get my boy. So he's, he's going, and you see, he'll get to be spit on and he'll be punched. So one Indian, he gets assaulted by the mob. Now we have this Pakistani uh, blogger talking about Hindus are dirty, God, whatever. Um, then you'll see the last part of this is he'll be thrown, the one Indian guy will be thrown away by the police. So the police are about to throw the one Indian guy who had been assaulted. They're about to violently remove him. Now the CTV, when they covered it, they didn't cover the fact that he getting spit on one, two, three, four. Right? They had this footage, and you know they have this footage because the only footage they ended up showing was this part. They see him being pushed away. Right? They missed him getting hit and spit on. Right? And it's interesting, you say, what? Usually, right, isn't sensational news supposed to sell? If it bleeds, it leads? What's a better story than a bunch of peaceful Indians who just happened to be there, and then a mob whipped up by a foreign country went to assault Canadians? And they did, they assaulted this guy, and him, look at this, isn't this, a, isn't this newsworthy? But it was reported the same way they reported Israel Pakistan. A fight broke out between India and Pakistan, right? One Indian guy was standing there, he was being punched, you know, equal, equal, whatever, right? It's the, it's the exact same targets, exact same mentality. All right, so now let's get to our useful idiots. This is how anti-Semitism, this is Bernie Farber, the chief enabler of anti-Semitism in Canada. He is on the CBC constantly as an expert in anti-Semitism. He is the head of the anti-hate network. He is a synagogue threatener extraordinaire and accuses himself, accuses others of what he is guilty of. Now, the synagogue threatening thing is, there was a conference going to be put on at a synagogue, Beth Tikva. Um, it's also the synagogue that I will be speaking at this week. Um, 
negative conference about different types of extremism in Canada, radical left, radical right, Islamic extremism. Farber calls up the rabbi, basically says, if you don't get this shut down, there's going to be consequences. Um, I have seen the emails, the rabbi then talked to me. A day later, Michael Corr comes out with an article in Now Magazine with the name of the synagogue, a picture of it saying, the disturbing anti-Muslim sentiment in the Jewish community, Beth Tikva shows a picture of it. Synagogue starts getting death threats and threats. They have to cancel the conference because the police says, we can give you security for the day, but we can't provide year-round security, which is what they were doing because they were, I mean, they all did a conference, people threatened to kill them. Obviously, this is how it goes. Now, there's a bit more to this. What is anti-Semitism to Bernie Farber? Is wanting to kill Jews anti-Semitism? We're about to experience what is not. So this is from Toronto Mosque. It's at Young and, uh, Young and Dundas. It is a mosque run uh, by a man, uh, Altawani al -Tia. He has said to the National Post that this mosque follows the values of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is part of an organization called the Muslim Association of Canada which on their website at the time this incident happened, said they follow the Islamic revival movement put out by Hassan al-Banna, who is the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the Islam, it's, it's the same thing. So on the website, they said, we are part of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas is part of the Muslim Brotherhood, and this prayer happens. And don't worry Hindus, you are not left out of this prayer, and we have, good, we have the thing, right? Allah give victory to the Islam and standing Muslims. Humiliate the polytheists, so basically, he goes on to say, Jews and Christians, spare not one of them, slay them one by one. There's indeed the part of the hill end with, cleanse the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the filth of the Jews, cleanse the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the filth of the Jews. And we're going to get back to the Al-Aqsa Mosque later. That is the Dome of the Rock or the Temple Mount. It's this hot button issue. And it's going to be very important in sort of the, the similarities between Hindu and uh, Kashmir and Israel. So pure, oh, yeah, purify the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the filth of the Jews. Now, Bernie Farber wrote an article in the Toronto Star saying he met this man praying beside him, and he was the nicest man in the world. Shocked. Shocked. This is the greatest human being that there ever has been. Read the Toronto Star book. The greatest, the greatest man. The, the kindest. He's preaching again now, but he's so amazing. What was the real problem? The real problem was the radical right. The radical right had mistranslated some of this, right? It was something like, instead of destroy, it really meant annihilate, or instead of annihilate, it meant destroy, and this was a mistranslation. So the radical right, uh-huh. Him and Karen Mark, they meet with the Muslim Association of Canada. Now I know people, this imam has pro-ISIS, pro-Al-Nusra, uh, pro-Al-Qaeda tweets out there, other anti-Semitic tweets. I know people that sent it to Bernie Farber before he met with him. Bernie Farber ignored it because this man, or maybe he's just the nicest guy ever. Maybe he just get in the room and said, ah, you know what? I want to kill the Jews and emulate like the polytheists, but let's go to brunch because I, I am, I'm great and he probably tweeted to bring to brunch and they reformed him and now he's teaching, um, now he's back at it. All right, here's, a, here's another friend who did, this is how, do you want to know how it got here? This was scheduled to be a talk on Tuesday, but then one of uh, the Farber friends gets, gets a hold of uh, Beth Tikva, sends a threatening email. I am a Bayit member and officer, and I also actively engage in the Jewish-Muslim dialogue as an individual, individual through the Shalom Hartman Institute. I see that Daniel Boardman is on your agenda December 10th. Not sure if you've seen his videos online, but a lot of uh, leans far right and anti-Islam. On one recent video, he aligned my good friend Muhammad Hashem with the Muslim Brotherhood, an outright lie. Boardman very well might be entertaining to a point, thank you, uh, but no doubt he's more suited for a JDL meeting than this esteemed congregation. Sija condemned him in a re not so subtle tweet. Please bet on yourself and whatever. Now, Sija didn't condemn me. They, they stood up for Muhammad Hashem, and the reason I called out Muhammad Hashem, it was the Sufi's restaurant thing. Do you remember, do you remember the Danforth shooting? Yeah. Yes. Do you remember that when the blood was still on the streets of the Danforth, the family put out a statement saying that, uh, you know, the guy who wrote the family statement? Muhammad Hashem. Do you remember the hijab hoax? Yeah. You, how did they get it to school right away? How was it there? And there's organizations there? The NCCM was there. With who? Muhammad Hashem. Brags about it, too. So, he's also, so I, I just brought up, and the NCCM, which has been identified in Canadian Senate testimony as a front organization for the Muslim Brotherhood, get into it. Come talk to me after if you want more proof. Um, they call him the driving force behind the NCCM. So, I thought I laid out a solid case. 
if anyone wants to question me on that, I, I've got more on him. Um, but let's just talk about it. All right. So now we get to the two different levels of enabling. Okay. The first one is not that bad. All right. The second one is the real problem. But I have named. This is why I'm a little bit controversial. Our first group is the first set of cues into the new ovens. All right. This would be Cedra, Hillel, the rest of the Do Nothing crew. They are popular with politicians because they ask them to do the very minimum. Very minimum. Zija wants you to do the minimum. They accept the minimum, and they want you to do the minimum, which is why politicians love them. Because if anti-Semitism happens, you say, I'm sorry, or it's bad. You did your work. They are easily fooled. They love to be lied to. They love it. That's why they work with Mohammed Hashem. They will work with the NTCM. They will work, and the NTCM is the one who put up the Muslim voting guide that said, we need BDS. That was the NCCM. Seja worked with them. He said, Seja, no, 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 we care about anti-Semitism a lot. You do? Yeah, of course. Of course we do. We've made friends. Look at us. We're Seja. Look, we've shaken hands. Oh, great. Apologies solve everything to this crew. An apology, right? You blow up the World Trade Centers. We got an apology from Osama bin Laden. Mission accomplished. This is if Seja was running the world. Now, Cedra and their friends have two modes. They do two things. They are one, shocked, and two, they are concerned. Okay, this is what they do. They are shocked and concerned, or shocked or concerned. Now, I have broken into Shimon Fogel's office and stolen the world's only Cedra to English dictionary, which means you're about to learn what is shocked. Shocked, definition according to Cedra. There has been an obvious and highly predictable act of anti-Semitism that we were previously warned about by community members and smaller organizations. Now that the wider community is also aware of it and in a state of outrage or hurt, we are making some noise about it to maintain the illusion that our organization actually does something. <laughs> Shocked. In CGs. Concerned. Verb. Definition. There is an impending act of anti-Semitism from an anti-Semitic individual or organization that we have done nothing about in the past and will continue to do nothing about in the future. <laughs> However, another Jewish organization has brought this incident to the attention of the Jewish community. Therefore, we are making some noise about it to maintain the illusion that we actually do something. Shocked or concerned. This is what they mean. This is what Sija does. So sometimes you might have reached out to a Jewish organization and they weren't that useful. It's because you're probably talking to CGen friends. Don't do that. They don't do anything for themselves. They won't do anything for you. Okay, so now here's the real problem. Here's the real problem in our community, and this goes for every community. The competition to be the last ones into the ovens. This is J Street, J Space, if not now, independent Jewish voices, Jewish Voice for Peace, the New Israel Front, and all their friends. These are the pro BDS Jews. This is when anti Semitism happens. They run to the defense and say, No, Linda Sassor, she's not anti Semitic, she's just anti Zionist. We need something, 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 Palestinian rights, or whatever. Now, if I'm a betting man, which sometimes I are, if you're going to put money down on this, I highly suggest you put your money on independent Jewish voices. These will be the people pushing the people from If Not Now into the ovens. Okay, what is not anti Semitism to independent Jewish voices? BDS or destroying Israel, saying Jews or Zionists control the media or America, mobs harassing Jews, saying Jews drink the blood of children, calling for a genocide of Jews, and actually killing Jews. None of these things qualify as anti-Semitism to independent Jewish voices. We learned that because of two recent incidents. One, the Hassan Galette incident. This was the, um, the MP that, the, that was so anti-Semitic even the liberals had to get rid of him. Some of the things he supported was a man who said, Jews drink the blood of kids. He supported a Hamas member and praised him for killing Jews. He also praised, uh, called someone, uh, got on radio and said, Zionists and Israel control the media. Then at Lawrence, Vent, and Herut, they also saw there's no anti-Semitism there, of course, BDS. The mob harassing Jews, calling for an anti-fada, or go, Jews go back in the ovens, open calls to genocide towards Jews. None of this is anti-Semitism. Independent Jewish Voices conducted an examination. They found no anti-Semitism in killing Jews, wanting to kill Jews, trying to kill Jews, saying Jews drink your blood. All of this is not anti-Semitism to independent Jewish Voices, which is why they are Hamas's best friend. Thankfully broke up with my younger brother. All right. Getting radical Islam into the West. How do we do this? 
How does the how does the ideology, which is dismembering people in Kashmir, blowing up people on buses in Israel, how does it get here? So how does this ideological laundering work? So there's the intifada, intifada. When you get people at York University last week, and you get a bunch of white kids from Alberta and Canada, antifada, don't be the antifada, right? You're, you're legitimizing this. And what is the antifada? So the groups of antifadas, it's uprisings. And in the uprisings, I'll give you a, a personal story. Um, I went to Jewish day school as a kid. Um, I might have been too well behaved one day that I was kicked out of class. I assume I did too much homework and I was thrown out of class. Happened a lot to me. As I was sitting outside of class, the teacher in the, the Hebrew teacher in the class beside me, a couple minutes in, she runs out of the room crying. I check in to see if they had pushed her to crying. Turns out the story was her young nephew was blown up on a school bus in Israel trying to go to school. One of the many suicide bombings of the second edge bomb. Hundreds of suicide bombings. They're still praised. By the way, your Canadian taxpayer dollars, just so you know, your taxpayer dollars will pay to go to UNRWA, which goes to Hamas, and they pay out the families of the people who perpetrate these murders. You are paying for it. Um, for paying. That was the second Antifada. So, when you get a chant, Antifada, Antifada, it's not hate speech. And you have people trolling for Antifadas out there. You're legitimizing suicide bombings in these groups. So, yes, not all Muslims are terrorists. No. But when the number of Muslims gets to who supports suicide bombings, it's different than those who support the concept of the Antifada, where there are suicide bombings. It's a gateway ideology, right? Once you get someone, your foot in the door to say, well, yeah, the Antifada is legitimate, and they're mentally committed to the Antifada. When if they're Muslim, then, oh, OK, yes, suicide bombings are acceptable if it's a bunch of Jews. <laughs> that makes it easier for suicide bombings to be acceptable. Well, you know, if, if you know, Article 370 is revoked, then you can suicide bomb. Or if, if there's Islamophobia, then you can suicide bomb. Right? It's, it's a gateway down there. And it also whitewashes this ideology within the wider public. It's not just the Muslim students yelling for the Antifada. Kashmiri independence. It sounds really nice. Doesn't, don't you want independence for Kashmir? Independence. Yeah, we all we learned that's a lie. But Salma Tulishan says she wants a Kashmir independence. She does it behind a sign that says Kashmir will become Pakistan. So independent. Also, there are parts of Kashmir occupied by Pakistan and China, which we won't get into. But that's how it works, right? You launder through humor. Do you believe Palestinian human rights? And here's how it works. It's an institute called the Sunrise Institute. So there's a momentum movement, and it's a wider, it's different than the UK and the US. But they have something called Sunrise, which is an environmental thing, but they also have If Not Now, which is their sort of fake Jewish pro-Palestinian activism. So basically, you get to university. Do you like trees? You want to save the trees? Who likes trees? I like trees. Should we keep the trees? Oh, you like trees? Sign here. Okay. Do you like Palestinians? Sure. Sign there. It's, it's all, they have networks and networks. If Not Now is connected to Sunrise. It's part of the wider momentum umbrella. All these people are in the same clubs, and believe me, it is easy to be a Palestinian activist. It's so easy. We, truth doesn't matter. Right? Palestine's been there since when? Day one. Day one. Everyone's Palestinian. You're a Palestinian, you're a Palestinian, you're a Palestinian, everyone's Palestinian. There's no social cost, right? It's, it's, uh, it's part of the left. There'll be a QA after. So it's just really easy. There's no social cost to being for Palestinian rights. Right? If you stand up for Zionism, right, then you might make some friends. But it's just easy. You go to socials. You just say all these things. It's slogans. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's all you need to know. What's the river? What's the sea? Who cares? Most people in the Palestinian activists, they've shown this. They don't know what the river or the sea is. They don't know. They can't name them. But it's easy. There was a study coming up Berkeley that most of them don't know the history. Most of them don't care about the history. And most of them don't care about the wider conflict of the region. That describes the majority of Palestinian activism on campus. Also, the UN mandates, right? If you believe in the UN, and I, you know, I'm just, I believe in, you know, this global government, and I believe in the European call, and, you know, why would all these countries say Israel's bad if Israel isn't bad? Right? The Security Council spends more than half of its time condemning Israel and actually doing things. Iran had one sanction last year. They, they currently killed a thousand people on the streets. UN? Now. We kind of talked about this, but you use the alt-right to, one, push your ideology, and as a boogeyman to help, you know, push your cause. So as we talked about, the alt-right and, and the radical left, intersectional left, work on the exact same ideological axioms when it comes to race. Power, privilege, life's about what type of skin color you have. So you use them to push that, but then the alt-right exists, and they're the boogeyman. 
Do you want to be alt right or do you want to be with us? All right, let's get into some similarities. And we'll get off soon. So both uh, former British colonies split in 1947. And as we learned from video speech, the same thing in, in the Muslims actually benefited more than the British rule than any others because they were often used by British as proxies. So they were, it, when I hear them up the airport complaining about European colonialism, I want to smack my head to the wall because no group in the world benefited more from European colonialism, Europeans included, than the Arabs. But the two nation theory, this is Pakistan and India. There must be two different nations for two different people. It's a two state solution, right? We have a two state solution. Israel and Jordan, we need another two state solution. 1940 participant plan, no, we don't accept. We need another two state solution. There'll be two state solutions, infinity, until it's just Tel Aviv right there, and then we'll need another two state solution, and on and on and on. The half life, you know, insert your own algorithm there. And if you don't think that ideology will come here to Canada, what, what is, it's Islamophobia, right? Muslims will be more persecuted than anyone else, so we need, you know, a separate place for Islam. Now, that's not coming anytime soon, but that's what the Islamists are pushing the road down to, of the theory, of the two nation theory. Uh, we need a place where we will be safe from Islamophobia. Same thing that happened in India and in Israel. Also, appeasement does not work. Never has. Okay? In 1967, when Israel won the Six Day War, the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the holiest place in all of Judaism, was taken back. Jews were allowed to play at their, play at their holy ground for the first time, ever, in 2000 years. Then they decided, you know what, let's give control of the Al-Aqsa Mosque to the Islamic Wafik of Jordan. We'll give the Muslims control of the Al-Aqsa Mosque as a, as a show of good faith. The number one reason given for suicide bombings is because of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Israel. The number one terrorist brigade in Hamas's core is the Al-Aqsa Brigade. The guy in Toronto who wanted to purify the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the filth of the Jews. What are you talking about? We gave you the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israel could have burned down the Al-Aqsa Mosque and kicked every stone into the river and then wrote a mean cartoon, drawn the Prophet Muhammad, and then done a dance. They would be equally as outraged as you giving them the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Tomorrow there will be a day of rage. You know what we call that? Monday. It's that every day is a day of rage in the West Bank. And it's a real thing. They do the day of rage, which is called Tuesday. <laughs> And the same thing with India. This is why India are repealing Article 370 is so important. Do something and say, if you don't show that you're strong enough to stand up for yourself, they will keep pushing. The media is inverted to reality. Complete inversion of reality. Completely inverted reality on these things. Right? We had, uh, I mean, the greatest example was probably the Kashmiri culture is under attack by Article 370. It's under attack. 370 revoked. Kashmiri culture is not radical Islam. Right? The people come into the country, that's radical Islam. That's anywhere you want. Real Kashmiri culture was destroyed by radical Islam. This is reviving it. But now we need to save it, right? It's an inversion of reality. Israel's committing ethnic cleansing and genocide. The population's increasing. Again, during 1967, Dagan sent buses to the Palestinians telling them, we're not trying to kick you off your land. Please come back to your land. We'll work something out. We'll offer all this land back in exchange for peace. Then they said, no peace, no, rec uh, no recognition. Um, uh, no negotiation. That was the three no's. They offered everything back after 267. We thought they were taken. No. Nope. No peace, no negotiation, no recognition, nothing. The type of genocides that both India and Israel committed is the type of genocide by not allowing someone else to commit a genocide. This is now the definition of genocide to the media's form. Again, Muslim population, Palestinian population increasing. This is a genocide. Hamas shoots rockets, we knock those rockets down. That is a genocide. India stops radical mobs from murdering Kashmiri pundits. That is a genocide. Truth doesn't matter. We have Hamas, you have Hezbollah Mujahideen, they have a charter, they want to kill you all, radical Islam, they're funded by the Canadian government. Justin Trudeau probably will speak at one of their conferences in a few years. Open declarations of hatred against Jews and Hindus, widely ignored and then justified. They could write it down on a piece of paper. Our founding mandate is death to Jews, Hamas. Founding mandate, death to Hindus. Put it up there. No one cares. No one even, no one's going to even look. And also, we have a long, rich history on our land. We are ancient peoples. We have talked about the connection of Hindus, Kashmir even providing stuff to the ancient temple in Jerusalem. So, that's what I'm going to leave off is know your enemy, 
There is a danger. It will come here if you do nothing. And you have to fight back. You have to stand up for yourselves, okay? Because what is the line? What's the line? If you're a Hindu, just celebrating India's independence, that's the new line. Because they'll come for you there. So are you willing to say, I'm just never going to talk about India. Never going to talk about my heritage. I'll never go out in public. I'll never go out in public and, and say I'm Zionist. Because that's the new line. So hide in your little hole all you want. Pretend the world won't come for you. But it will. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Your energy is contagious, I would say. Mm -hmm. May I request both our esteemed speakers to be here so that we can start, start our Q&A session. Yes. So, let's start with you, sir. Hey, I'm Samir Pandey. And uh, how can we stop our taxpayers' money from going to these organizations? Don't vote for Justin Trudeau is, is, is cancer number one. In a, serious, in a serious note, now I can't openly talk about this, but there's another organization which, full disclosure, I am a member of, called Canadians for the Rule of Law. And we are working on taking legal measures against the government. So. One of the things that if you're a Kashmiri pundit, uh, you can come talk to me. We're trying to actually get um, an order. Like if we can file a victim claim, uh, if you were a Kashmiri pundit forced off your land, uh, we can try and get the government to put a, a, an order of memorandum. If you file a victim complaint, you can work with us. Uh, that might put a freeze on sending money specifically to the ISNA. Um, so we're, there, there are organizations. We are trying to work on it. We are trying to put in legal measures, but again, the government gets to decide these things, and they have unlimited resources to fight us. Um, but first and foremost, don't vote for Trudeau. Two, try and raise these issues. And, and three, um, if you're a Kashmiri pundit and you actually want to stop this, come talk to me. Get, get your, I'll come, give me your contact information, and I, I might be able to set something up um, going down the line. Yes, please. Yes. Um, you know, like uh, in Canada now, the new government of uh, Mr. Trudeau, uh, there is a ministry of uh, diversity and whatever. Equity and inclusion. And inclusion, right, okay. Now, uh, I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty if you could clarify. I, I came to Canada from communist Eastern Europe as a stateless political refugee, okay? But once I became Canadian citizen, I'm no longer a refugee and I don't get any money for what happened. Now, a Palestinian comes, and he's a refugee, his children and his grandchildren will be a refugee, and they can apply to, uh, to get money. You know, they live here, they could be living in Toronto, Regina, wherever. They can get a monthly stipend for being a refugee, and the Canadian government gives money to uh, UNWRA uh, for this purpose. Uh, can you clarify how this okay, so policy? Okay, so the answer to the solution again is don't vote for Justin Trudeau, but <laughs> there are two types of refugees in the world. There are standard refugees, like he just talked about, then there are Palestinian refugees. And UNRWA governs Palestinian refugees specifically. And the reason why they're different is there's a different definition for a refugee for a Palestinian refugee. The definition of a Palestinian refugee is someone who had a family member, I believe, lived in the land of Israel for two years. It's like between 19, 19 and 19, 1948 or something. It's like this 30 year period that if you had an ancestor that lived in that land for two years during that period, you qualify as a refugee. Your children are a refugee, their children are refugees, their children are refugees, their children are refugees. That's a This is why we wanted to, yes. It's insane. This is why Jews are so mad when we fund UNRWA. This organization is ridiculous. So you could have been a Palestinian farmer, and you could have come to live on a Zionist farm for work for two years, had a great relationship with the person. <clears throat> then after your two years, you had enough money, you go to Egypt, you start a family there, you're happy, whatever. You come to Canada, da -da -da -da. your grandkids are Palestinian refugees. 
by legal definition under UNRWA. So this is how it happens. It's because UNRWA has a different definition for Palestinian refugees, and the purpose is to keep them refugees to use as a political hammer against the Israelis, which is why even though there were 700,000 refugees of the Arab-Israeli conflict who were Arab, there is now 20 million Palestinian refugees worldwide because they just keep growing because they're forever refugees by legal definition. That's because Palestinians are the first people. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please, sir. Oh, I have a question about the uh, Kashmir uh, genocide. Why Kashmir? India is very big. Why is that region the focus of this conflict? Uh, and what is the, the Indian government, it's the state of India, so what, what is the Indian government doing about it? And I, I also think you said something about the British. Uh, somehow being complicit. I'm not sure if I heard it right because it was kind of quick. Can you just make a little comment? It's, it's, a, it's a very long history. Like, you know, when, in 1947, when India basically got independence, British left. So there were 560 princely states, which were basically, you know, part of a unite, unionized India. And they were given an option by the Britishers to basically go either with Pakistan, because Pakistan was created on the line, religious lines. So there were two states created by Britishers. So one was on the Islamic uh, state of Pakistan on the lines of religion, while India remained secular. So it was not created as a, you know, as a religious state. So the option was basically that they can either choose either domain, either go with Pakistan or they will remain with India. So for, out of 560 states, Kashmir was a kind of a, you know, a square, uh, you know, a round peg in the square hole kind of a thing. Because the king was a Hindu and the majority of the population was Muslim. So the king chose to stay with India because Pakistan attacked it. In 1947, there was a war. There was the first war between India and Pakistan. So Pakistan attacked Kashmir, and King chose to stay with India. He signed the accession accord with India, and the United Nations meddled into it, due to whatever reason, they were like, it's a long history. And then it was decided that there will be a plebiscite, which means that the mandate of the people, like any other democracy in the world, that the mandate of the people will be asked. So whom they want to stay with. So, but there was a precondition to that under the United Nations, you know, uh, you know, rule that the Pakistani government will take back their army completely uh, from the, from that place, and Indian government will take enough army to stay there so that the people are defended. And once these two preconditions are met, then there will be, a, you know, plebiscite. Like like any other conflict, Pakistan never basically complete, you know, fulfill those the first two conditions. So the, the the issue remained the same, and then Pakistan always meddled into it. Find the you know what you call the religious power, and the, the matters you know be continuously remain in the same. And there was an Article 370 which gave some special status to the government of you know of Kashmir. So they were like the laws of the land. They are not all of them applicable to the you know government of Kashmir there. So eventually, what happened very recently that the government completely merged the, the domain of Jammu and Kashmir with India in a, in, a, in a true unification. So, I mean, that's been the flashpoint. And then China got involved in, it, in, in a war. So part of Kashmir is with China. Part of Kashmir is with Pakistan. And part of Kashmir is with India. It's a, it's a mess. I'll, I'll add something to that also. Think of it as the Golan Heights. So it's also a mountainous high ground. It's a great staging area for terrorist attacks against India. So there's a legitimate security concern as well. Yes, yes please. Yes, please. Um, I think that I would like to give a very short message to the Kashmiris here, and it is one of the things that we have learned as Jews over the past hundred years. The anti-Semitism that Daniel talks about will never go away. There will always be anti-Semites in the world. What makes a difference is only one thing. Some of you wear a hat, I wear a hat. We have that in common. 50 years ago, 70 years ago, I could not walk out in the streets of Toronto with a hat on my head, not 57. My father had to sneak home through the back alleys in Toronto here from school as a kid so as not to have rocks thrown at him. The only reason we are able to walk proudly in the streets today is because of Israel because Israel exists, and Israel is a power. And then there is one more piece that's exceptionally important. We live by the Torah, and the Torah tells us a lot of lessons, but there's one main lesson 
that is repeated over and over again. It must be a just society. The society that you make for yourselves, make it a just society, make it something that you can be proud of, make it something that can stand tall. Because the media and those who want to hate you will always hate you. And that's the best message. Build your own reality. Build your own place. Because that's where you will have a place. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sandeep. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thanks so much for the very impressive session. Uh, being an Indian, I knew only 20% of what uh, Vijay mentioned and 32% of what uh, Vijay mentioned. So, very impressive. Uh, information goes a long way in displaying the you know, no, uh, notions. Um, I would like your assessment as to uh, whether it is still worthwhile uh, sort of uh, trying to reach out to the same and wise voices within sort of the Muslim community. Or do you think that has been done enough and so, so that's a uh, few times for it? and uh, not really you know, pay, uh, paying off. Uh, this sort of message uh, in a more balanced manner, sort of like you're giving uh, the, the, the true story, but also balancing out with some truths which might have been done. Would that be more palatable to the mainstream and sort of like more uh, liberal voices who are looking for justice, or uh, sort of uh, they, they, they can see the oppression that's been done to the communities, but may not be sort of uh, like, you know, uh, very right thing, sort of thing, right? Yeah, I hear what you're saying is, I'm the first one to acknowledge that I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Okay, so I, I understand. And so is it worth appealing to the most moderate Muslim voices? Absolutely. The problem is, you go back to Sita, is when you appeal to the wider Muslim community and you're just happy when, when you catch a fish and you don't look at and see what you're getting. So again, like, I'm not going to tag TV owned by a modern Muslim. Like, Rahil Razas, Salim Mansour, there, there's a bunch of people who are very worth allying with. And build a coalition of the willing. There are tons of Muslims who ran away from Muslim majority countries because of Sharia law who are going to be your ally. Don't pull a seizure and be easily lied to. If you can look up an organization like the NCCF and see, wait, that's the Muslim Brotherhood, and they say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll partner with you, don't make that deal with the devil. So when you partner, make sure they're actually who they say they are, uh, not you know, you know, don't don't go to the, the raising the reviving Islam, Islamic spirit conference, you know, and expect to, to hear anything halfway reasonable. And can we be? Yeah, there are different for different or, for different audiences. There are different ways to get this message out. Um, absolutely. And and if if this was me giving to a neutral audience lecture of at university students, it would have been completely different. Um, well, I mean, uh, like we, we have basically, like for example, I mean, one of the key elements in, in, in India is like you know, why Kashmiris are taking guns. That's like so because they were like not given enough opportunities, they were subjugated. If that is the benchmark, then when a half a million, you know, Kashmiri Hindus were thrown out, we had all the reasons to pick up guns. So it's basically an ideology. What we did, we didn't, we shunned violence. We have forgiven, but we have not forgotten. So what we did, we basically went back to the schools, whether they were like shanties or in tents, and we built ourselves back again. And we returned back, like in the last 30 years, a half a million small community has produced like 50,000 engineers, doctors, and professionals. So we, we are returning back to the society and trying to make this world you know, somehow a better place to live in. So the, the justification that if something bad happens to me, I have returned back to the society, that's not the way. And as uh, Dan said, we have a lot of liberal Muslims, like Tarabai is here, like for example, he's supporting. I mean, he's looking at the truth. I'm, I'm, we're not asking people or, or the, you know, the, the Muslim mosques outside to basically, you know, just side with us just because we have been subjugated to a terror. No, just look at the truth. I mean, same thing cannot happen again and again. Like seven exodus in like 500 years, so that means there's something wrong basically happening. And the modus operandi is the same. So, so we, we have to choose basically our friends and, and look at our enemies. Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, and thank you for shining light on uh, everything in India. Um, my question is, uh, why do you think uh, it's difficult for 
uh, refugees who come here, Muslim refugees who come here, comes in yet, have an issue with state over religion and don't sort of abide by, um, will rather sort of listen to Sharia or want to, you know, go with, you know, with, with their religion and not so, with men. Uh, I, I, it's, and it's, it's, I think it's the fault of, listen, I have no problem with multiculturalism if you want to talk about ethnic plurality. I, I don't care. Like, I care about values, inside, not, not outside. Like, I, but, you know, the multicultural theory and policy, as it's implemented in Canada, is, is a policy of everyone in their own little enclaves. And, and you notice this, really, because when you hear someone who is a strong leftist talk about how much they love everyone else's culture, what do they talk about? Food. <laughs> Seriously, no. I love Indian people because I could never live without masala and only bread. Or I love Japanese people because who I, I love going out sushi with my friends. Okay, do you love Japanese culture? Do you respect the Bushido code? Are you gonna perfect a skill for 15 years and really dedicate yourself to the craft? Are you like, no, 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 not that part of the culture, just I like sushi. So it's all very bad in the front line, which means everyone lives in their own little ethnic enclaves. And when you live in your own little ethnic enclave, you're gonna get the pressures from that society. So if you leave Syria and then you move to cold Syria, you're gonna have the values of Syria. And because there is, I mean, I would like to sort of, I get it, we're, we're, we're not a melting pot, we're a mosaic, but let's turn the temperature up a little bit, right? And Canadian values are good for refugees coming here. Like, you wouldn't want to come here as someone from India, let's say, and just have everyone in Canada completely ignore you and just pretend you're in Kashmir. No, you wonder if to talk to them and be like, how about them leave games, right? Should we fire Babcock? We really should have. We did, it was great. <laughs> Right? Hockey Day in Canada in Punjabi is a great thing. Right? You only address that. If, if people who come from the Punjab region are only watching cricket here, they're not going to intermingle. They're not going to get the values and benefits of our society. So the, the onus is really on our society. I don't actually don't blame the Muslims for, for that. I, I blame the weakness in Canadian culture for us not either extending our hands in friendship or saying, it's good for you to sort of integrate here. Come, come join us. Instead, it's like, we have, oh, they have nice restaurants. It's, yeah. Um, I also had just another, sorry, just one more question. Um, someone who went through the university system, went to Western University. Um, why is it that you don't see um, either left-leaning or right-leaning Muslims condemning like a lot of attacks on universities, like throughout the world? Like I, I really never saw that. I see. A lot of the major Muslim university organizations, Muslim Student Association, is a Muslim brother group. Yeah. So most of them get tons of funding from Qatar, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Muslim Brotherhood. Um, those are not moderate places. So, unfortunately, a lot of the money is coming from outside the country and it does not fund um, Canadian values. Mm. And you can see it everywhere, it's like selected outrage. Say, for example, when anything happens in India, the entire Muslim Brotherhood will stay, all India is doing something bad in Kashmir. Like, we, we saw some of our politicians doing it. But what is China doing in China? A million Muslims are basically in subjugation camps. Nobody talks about that. How many Indian Muslims or for the matter of Pakistani Muslims go outside the Chinese embassy and you know raise their voice? It's a selected outrage. And that's that's what's happening even here. Thank you. Yes, please. Um just wanted to go back to the feminist mosque which you highlighted there, that the son of the executive director of that mosque was just recently appointed to the Police Services Board. He was also the side that Craig in the video. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, if you want to know why your police aren't doing anything, it's because they have their hands tied by these police services board that are subjected to political entryism. Now, Daniel, for you, perhaps you want to acknowledge the fact that his father gives spiritual lessons in Khalid Rashid's constituency office and explain who he is. Oh, my friend Khalid Rashid. So, Altani al the head of the Dundas Street Mosque, as we talked about, says this mosque follows the values of the Muslim Brotherhood. He is on the board, uh, he's involved in the Muslim Association of Canada, of course. He's also on the board of Islamic Relief Canada, where millions of tax dollars of yours go. So the Atiyah family is quite well connected. Sarah Atiyah is, went to, uh, left Stephen Harper's Canada to go move to Mohammed Morsi's Egypt, that was the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt, because it had better values. She married Khalid al Kazaz, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood government. They had kids. Khalid al Kazaz ended up being arrested. Now, because he was being held, 
The Canadian government went into overdrive. Omar al Ghazi, Justin Trudeau, they needed to get Khalid al Qazaz, Muslim Brother member, out of Egypt and bring him to Canada where he can do great work. They did. He's now here. He set up the al Qazaz charity. Sarah T and Khalid al Qazaz, they have a charity. This charity does great work according to Khalid Rashid. What they do is they uh, take refugees, refugees who come into Canada, they go to um, Khalid al Qazaz's foundation, and it teaches them how to adjust to Canadian life and Canadian values. He is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, not a Muslim Brotherhood front group, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Egyptian one, the same thing from Hassan al Ben, same one. Now, Khalid Rashid, conservative MPP in Doug Ford's government, he gets up in Parliament and says, I'm just going to take some time to acknowledge how great the Kazaz Foundation is, Sarah Atiyah and Khalid al Kazaz. They are great Canadians doing great work. This, this organization is committed to uh, equity of outcome. So uh, equity of outcome, communism if you want to know, um, social justice, and, and whatever. So he gives them a big boost. And Khalid Rashid, by all accounts, Muslim brother. Now, Doug Ford's been shown this information, by the way, a whole security file. I've been shown the same thing by concerned people within the parties. Doug Ford looked and said, well, people say things about me that aren't true, so they must be not true about him. However, the real reason is Khalid Rashid brings money, money into the party. Khalid Rashid will raise more funds for a fundraiser than all conservative cabinet ministers put together. Then he promises them votes. The votes don't come, but the money comes. So it's, this guy was recently promoted to deputy whip of the party. He is, and then again, Atiyah, who follows the values of the Muslim Brotherhood, who's associated with it. He gets up and praises the Muslim Brotherhood, promoted from the party, and then at his constituency office, it's open season for radicalization. The Muslim Brotherhood is in every single major party in Canada, and no one is doing anything about it in politics. Who do you vote for? Me. <laughs> Don't vote for me. Don't vote for me. I don't know. Um, Andrew Shear's not going to do anything about it. It's, it's, we're in a conundrum. Yes, please. So we cannot trust the Conservative Party either. So here's the difference between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party. So the NDP ran headlong. The NDP, the NDP were so enthused that they joined forces with the Muslim Brotherhood before the Muslim Brotherhood even thought. They actually jumped out. So that's that. The Liberal Party, it's like slow motion running through the daisy field, loud music playing, arms out stretched and pressing, and they're currently twirling in a field, just gazing into each other's eyes. It's lovely. So the, the Liberals, will take Omar al Gaba, give him a big position in the party. They, they'll say, oh, you know, Igor Khalid, that's our new star. The liberals will take Muslim Brotherhood people and put them in positions where they, in, within their strongholds so they can be in control of the society. The conservatives, when they get the chowries, whatever, their general MO is, okay, we kind of just, we want to reach out to this community or the Pakistan community. So they'll, they'll bring these people to the party, but then they run them in sort of liberal strongholds right now. So, their foot's in the door, right? They're not currently deputy whips, of the, I mean, other than Khalid Rashid is the top ranking one in Ontario. But the difference is the conservatives will, will just, are, are sort of in the flirting stage right now. They're dating, right? The liberals and the, their relationship, um, the NDP and, and the Muslim brother, they're married. The conservatives are sort of going through this courting phase right now. And when I bring up this issue, sometimes people within the conservative party will message me saying, you're right, here's some more information. Keep going, keep going. Will you say anything about it? No, 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 I'm too afraid. Uh, but you keep going, you keep going. I support you. The liberals, they're not that happy. This is the difference. The liberals are in a relationship, the conservatives are courting. Choose a lesser evil. It's the choose a lesser evil. And if you wonder why Maxi Bernie had a party, Oh. <laughs> so the reason the Hindus didn't vote for the liberals, but they didn't. Some of the Hindus didn't vote for the conservatives because of Ford's money cuts. So it was a very confusing election this time. They didn't vote for any. Yeah. So they voted no, for. Yeah. Uh, some voted for the yeah. party, and it was it was like a big model. Yeah, I mean the Conservative Party is sort of an exorcism of of the leaders <laughs> and the cowards. I mean the Conservative Party, like the Conservative Party. If they had a motto, it would be extreme cowardice all the time. <laughs> and then Sage would sue them for uh, copying the slogan, but um, that would be, that would be, that's the, that's the interesting conservative party is cowardice all the time. Yes, please. You guys, yes. you guys seem to recognize what's going on, what's going on in the street, call it all right. You know, you're labeling some of these people around, you know, like they're going to blow up the world. I mean, there's people, there was a big thing out here about David Lim. Hear about that? The, the Christian preacher who tried to get through March on Church Street? 
Yeah, the pastor, that was huge, right? Yeah. And a lot of police were there, um, usual side left and right. So Ron here, there's just this people faith called. I mean, I understand, you know, the, you know the, I, I remember the, the, the Israeli defense ministry, he made a comment, I always remember this, he said, we have bigger things to worry about than, you know, white supremacists. I'm not suggesting that's not a problem. But I think you need to start recognizing and bringing these people in, some of the people. You know, I'm not, I'm not concerned at all that any of these guys, Ron and other people, are, uh, you know, are, are dangerous people. So I think if, if you don't bring those people in, then those people are just going to, like, so, so, jump in front of you. I mean, so, so, I mean, what people do is, like, listen, I don't, like, listen, I don't think you are. I don't know. By the way, I'm saying, are you saying we should bring in the alt rights? No. Or, or yeah, like, yeah, people, well, people that are out there. Like the other day, Ron got his bullhorn. Trudeau was a dug down square. Okay, but are you calling Ron alt right? right? No, I'm not. No, no. no. Okay, so, so, but that's what you—that's what people are calling. Okay, okay, yeah, so, okay. So, okay let me, I, I get what you're saying. Is right? you have to be careful. Do don't make deals with the devil. Okay. You should never bring in the actual alt right. Their ideology is corrosive, and they'll never be productive. But you know, I'll be called alt right too. And, yeah. And video will be called alt right because it's sitting too close to me. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So there's, I mean, yes, people being productive. You know, try and hear people out, see what they're saying, and you know, just because. Okay, if 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 a 22 year old college student thinks someone is all right, doesn't mean they're all right. But if they're getting up there talking about preserving the white race and white genocide and 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 all this crazy all right stuff. Well then, no, they're, they're never going to help you, they'll never be productive, but you know, if you want to say, hey, there's someone being falsely labeled as all right, who we need to defend, yes, defend people being falsely labeled as all right, don't let them push you over to the window, because it's the same thing. You must, it, it's, a, it's a very hard line to, to rip, but if someone's all right, you absolutely must call them out and get rid of them. But if someone isn't, and they're trying to push the line for, further, you have to stop it there, because they will keep pushing that line further and further down the road until everyone's part of the alt-right who isn't part of like whatever Marxist party that's too far left for the NDP. Yes, please. Yeah, um, one to talk about, I know a lot of these organizations that you talk about, it is a wretchedly difficult job to actually go in the, in the swamp and weed out actual racists, actual alt-righters from those who are falsely labeled as such. Uh, one of the reasons that we engage with some of these organizations is to try to prevent them from going in that direction and to pluck out the more useful parts of, of that swamp. Question about uh, Maxine Bernier and the PPC. Uh, they're kind of fringe. They don't perform well in elections. They're somewhat disorganized, as I know. Is there anything there that uh, you'll have to see them? Um, this is one of the great questions. So, I mean, if I if you learned anything from the previous Canadian election, it's that Canadians are highly pragmatic with their votes. And what I mean by this is the polling numbers. Let's say they have the Liberals and Conservatives around thirty-three percent. Both the Liberals and the Conservatives outperformed their current polling numbers, and all the sort of fringe parties, except the Bloc, which had, because the Bloc had a chance of winning, but you know, the NDPs, the Greens, and the PPC, they all did worse. And this is sort of shows how pragmatic Canadians are in their votes. And if you contrast that to what we learned by the Trump election, it was that there are people afraid to say to pollsters that the polling bias was anti-conservative. These people not saying that. So that being said, what, I mean, there are too many forces working against the PPC now. In order for the PPC to grow, they'll have to stick around. Um, will the media let them stick around because they don't have any seats now? How do they get their messaging out? Um, will Maxine Brady want to make another run for it? How good is he communicating in English is another thing. Um, so the PPC is a wait and see. The PPC is just like, how badly will Andrew Shear screw up the Conservative Party over the next few years? That is probably the biggest determinant of the PPC. Anyone else? Do you have any questions? Yes, Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, what's your advice, uh, whether it's Kashmir or Israel, against uh, just kind of like people who, who defame the, the cause or, you know, libel, libel, like, you know, the, like you talked about all the anti-Semitic uh, stuff about Jews drinking children's blood and stuff like that. The blood blood. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, how, how do you have, or, or whether it's like some kind of a genocide in Kashmir, um, I know it's applicable for both situations, but what, 
I mean, like, what, what do you recommend is the best sort of defense against people who just kind of fabricate lies and sort of come up with, 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 with slander and libel that's not really based on any kind of truth? See, the best thing what we can all do is, you know, it's, 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 an, it's a word of narrative. So the more lies somebody spreads, or a thousand times, it sometimes becomes a joke. That's what they have been doing. We probably were in a, in a la la land thinking that we are on the right path and we are the truthful people, truthful prevail. It doesn't work like that in today's world. So we should basically have such kind of meetings where we can basically talk about. I'm sure that probably 90% of the audience probably will know the, the depth of what happened in history. So probably people just need to, you know, oh, something's happening here or India. And the way the narrative has been built by the Western media. That India is, it, it is a do dominant country, India has done so, so much you know, atrocities in history, which is absolutely false. Like India has been at the receiving end for the last 70 years. I mean, as, as, as Dan said, you know, it doesn't work basically the way it has happened over. You know, it, appeasement doesn't work. We, well, we have a mean business now, and that's what the current government is doing. They have basically cleared the rot for the last 70 years. Like, Three major decisions have been taken, taken just like this part of six years. Like this article in 70 has been, you know, on our head like a sword for the last 70 years. It's been clear now. So, what we need to do basically as Indians, who, who's our opposite here, like as he said, that we should be speech the right government. I believe personally that the current government should be at least the next 20 years. So that, like, whatever the appeasing government has been doing for the last 70 years, the Congress government, I mean, they should be weeded out, they have been weeded out. But sometimes they you know, spread their heads uh, up and down. Now, what we can do here when we are in Canada, we should basically create such seminars. We should basically get more and more Canadians across the diaspora, across the melting pot, what we call, involved with us. Listen to our story. We are not telling you to believe it. Just go and listen. We are, we are living in, 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 a, in a very informed world these days. Just go and talk to the right people. Don't go just believe what's happening on the WhatsApp University or on the Facebook University. Just go to the root. I mean, talk to the people and then find out what the truth is and let the truth prevail. And that's exactly what Dan and me are trying to do here. We're trying to communicate with the people. We're trying to bring the truth, which has been basically hidden, not only to the bosses in Canada. I think 80% of the Indians will do no more. That, that's what has been happening in the last 30 years. But what we have gained in the last five years, since social media has basically strengthened, we are in a, in a very connected world, our voices are being heard now. I mean, just 30 years of exodus, 30 years of our genocide, but probably our voice is being heard for the last five or six years. It has happened due to some people who are taking their time and time and going out, talking to the world, what happened. Otherwise, it was like, you know, a piss on past over and for story which had happened for so many years. Yeah, that's great. Like, know the truth yourself. And for events, I, I find it's much more productive for Jews and Indians to come together and sort of talk because if I go to the Israel people, they know, I, like a billion things in my presentation. They agree. They just say, Palestine, can't even say the people, right? Can't agree. But it's valid for the Hindus to learn, and it's really valid for the Jews to learn about the Hindu side. So it's good to know the truth. And then if you're confronted with the lies, how to counter them, that's a situational thing. Is it a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Then try to be as reasonable, as empathetic as you can, and try to explain the truth, and, and yes, and listen. Now, if we're in public and let's say you're a crazy, you know, Muslim brother thing and you're coming at me, well then I'm not talking to you. I'm trying to sort of either, if it's on video, I'm trying to humiliate you to make your position unpopular for other people out there or to make my point to the others. So it, it depends on also context. Then. Is it a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Are they yelling? Like if a mob's yelling at you, you can't reason from a mob. Are you in public? There's a, there's a whole different ways. But knowing the truth is, is always the way to start. The problem with truth is it's better for those people who are basically having a vested interest. I'd like to bring you to a notice here that seven or eight years back, or rather nine years back, when my friend Tahir Gora was running a TV show, and he had never basically got a Kashmiri Hindu point of view on his TV show, and that he was the first one probably in the history that a Kashmiri Hindu had you know, an independent platform where he could basically narrate the, those horror, horrific stories and tales. The truth was so bitter that the Pakistani council had to basically pull wires to take the show off the air. Can you imagine that? And we had to run a campaign, I mean, 
which went up to the hot one, uh, you know, uh, near, you know, offices, and then show had to be released with a, with a kind of a disclaimer. That's the kind of you know media narrative we are fighting against. The Pakistanis are not happy with Tahir Bora. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically speaking the truth. Yes. Basically speaking the truth. Please. Yes, please. Uh, have you been able to contact Rajiv Mahotra from Insurance Company? Yes. Rajiv is basically, I mean, there are so many of, you know, like, you know, as I said, in just the last five or six years, our voice has been heard. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad to share with all of you here, particularly people of Indian origin, that even the film industry, that one of the largest film industry in the world, even basically did justice to us. I mean, when, when, when 47 partition happened, I don't know how many people know here, that how many people died, that, that the biggest tragedy of the world. 1.5 million people were butchered in 1947, and like more than 10 million people, families basically were displaced. So a lot was written about it. Films were made, books were written, so much people knew about it. But what about us? All Indians know here that not a single film or a documentary or even a web series was made on how we Kashmiri Hindus were forced to flee our houses. How, how our men and women were, were you know, uh, you know, terrorized, how our women were raped, how our houses were set on fire. In last 30 years, in an Indian government, with the constitution of India, the largest democracy in the world, all our temples have been desecrated. We're talking about thousands and thousands of temples and, you know, they've been vandalized by people there. And whatever measures were done by the government of India, whichever government was there, they thwarted it. The, the festive forces in the valley, and we you know, backed by the entire, you know, what do you call the radical machine, they, they thought of it. So that's the kind of, you know, it's, it's again a David and Goliath kind of a story, where we are fighting, you know, a, a big machine. And, and I'm sure that, you know, these kind of events will happen. And, you know, uh, if people like Raju Malhotra, Sushil Pandit, um, Pushpendra Kulshreis or J.D. Bakshi, these are the people who have basically been our voices for the last few years. And, I, and I'm so glad that Daniel is here, Thai Mai is here, who are basically being our voices in this part of the world. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, a huge shout out to Canadian Anti Semitism Education Foundation, Canadian Institute of Jewish Research, here in Canada, as for our fellowship, Global Kashmir Funded Diaspora, Indo Canadian Kashmir Forum, Baloch Human Rights Council, and our media partners, TAC TV and CTV Canada. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. watching Tag TV.